Now, some half hour later than scheduled, we finally join Patrick Moore as he sets our sights on the sky at night. Good evening. There are several news notes this month. A very important discovery has been made by Professor Michael Rowan Robinson and his team using the William Herschel Telescope at La Palma in the Canary Islands. They seem to have located what may well be the most luminous object known in the entire universe. If the measurements are correct, then it's something like 16,000 million light years away and shining 300 million million times as brightly as our sun. And this is the position, actually in Ursa Major, is indicated there by the letter F between the two arrow bars. But what exactly is it? Well, it may well be a quasar embedded in a huge cloud of dust. And that idea, I think, is strengthened by the fact that it radiates mainly in the infrared, which is what would be expected. But I won't say any more about it now, because in the September sky at night, Professor Rowan Robertson is going to come and join me and give us the latest news about it when the analyses have been done. The sun has been very active. During June, there was a huge sunspot. And I made this drawing by projection with my five-inch refractor, and you can see the spot there. And in fact, there's also a very good video of it made by Paul Davis of Bath. And you can see it very clearly. I may say the background here is not the full diameter of the sun, but merely that of the field. And the actual shimmering is due to the Earth's atmosphere. But it was a very active spot group. It produced a flare. It produced a magnetic storm. And we thought that it might produce a brilliant aurora, though in the event it didn't. It should come back onto the disk later on this month, though whether it will be still be as large, of course, we don't yet know. I've also had many letters about the brilliant display of planets in the western sky after sunset. Venus, Mars and Jupiter have all been there, and I'm rather pleased with this photograph that I took from my garden in Selsey. See a lighted window there. Venus is the brightest over to the right, then Jupiter and then Mars. Well, um, I'm afraid the display is over now, but at least Venus is still prominent for some time after sunset, and if you have a telescope, or even good binoculars, you'll see it now looks like the shape of a crescent. But this evening, I want to talk mainly about the planet Saturn. In fact, all the three outer giants are now in the same part of the sky. Uranus and Neptune are in Sagittarius the Archer, though, of course, Uranus is only just visible with the naked eye, and Neptune not at all. Saturn is in Capricornus the sea goat, and it is very slowly coming north in the sky, even though, so far as we are concerned, it's still rather low down. But when you look at Saturn through a telescope, it really is superb. And that was a view I had the other night. And you can see there the yellowish flattened disk, the lovely ring system, the two bright rings separated by the Cassini division. And there's nothing like that in the entire sky. Mind you, with the naked eye, Saturn isn't really distinguished. It looks simply like a rather bright star. At the moment, it's in a rather barren area. There's nothing much in Capricornus. But a few years ago, when Saturn was in the Scorpion, I took that picture. And there is Saturn near the top, and to the right is Antares, the red supergiant in Scorpius. And you can see Saturn is rather the brighter of the two. But um, it's nothing like so bright as Jupiter or Venus, but um, it's still bright enough to be conspicuous. And although it's now about 830 million miles from the Earth, it's bright because it's big. Just compare Saturn with our little Earth. There is Saturn, and there is our tiny Earth. Saturn's diameter, as measured through the equator, is 75,000 miles. The orbital period, or year, is 29 and a half times as long as ours. But the rotation period, or day, is only 10 and a quarter hours. Now, the density is only 0.7 times that of water. And it's been said, if you could drop Saturn into a vast ocean, it would actually float. And the axial inclination is just a little bit more than ours. Now, as I've said, it's a long way away. If you could get into a sports car and drive straight from the Earth to Saturn, travelling at a steady 100 miles per hour and never stopping at all, the journey would take you about um, 950 years, and I don't recommend trying it. In a planet of the solar system, you can see that very clearly. The four little planets out as far as Mars, and then Jupiter, and then Saturn. And this is rather a good diagram, as it shows where the planets are now. The Earth is almost in between Saturn and the Sun, 
And later in July, Saturn will therefore come to opposition. It will be opposite the sun in the sky and due south at midnight, whereas Mars and Jupiter are now on the opposite side of the sun and they're vanishing into the evening twilight. Now, as I've said, Saturn is less dense than water and the makeup is very different from that of the Earth. And the mass is 95 times as great as that of the Earth. Well, to show what I mean, just let's imagine we could put Saturn in one pan of a gigantic pair of scales. You would then need 95 Earths to balance it. We have 95 miniature Earths here, and you'll have to take my word for it that at the moment, in that second pan, there are 92 miniature Earths. Now let's add three more. 93, 94, 95, and there we go, and as you can see, 95 Earths balance one Saturn. So clearly, Saturn's makeup is very different from that of the Earth. When we look at it, we are seeing the top of a layer of cloud. Beneath that, we come to a layer made up of liquid hydrogen, helium and ice, all mixed together. Below that, we come to another layer, also liquid, but this time metallic hydrogen. Hydrogen which is so compressed that it actually starts to behave in the manner of a metal. And then, at Saturn's core, we come to the rocky interior, the only really solid part of Saturn, and where the temperature is quite high. And all the giant planets are made up in very roughly the same way. They are totally unlike worlds such as the Earth. Now, when you look at Saturn through a telescope, or see a photo of it, it's dominated by the rings. But please don't think that the globe of Saturn is uninteresting. It's anything but that. We can see there cloud belts, rather similar to Jupiter's, although not so pronounced, wisps, spots and festoons. And although there's nothing like Jupiter's great red spot, we do see bright white spots very occasionally. One was discovered in 1933 by a very unusual astronomer, W.T. Hay. Better known to you, I expect, as Will Hay, the stage and screen comedian, who was a very good amateur astronomer indeed. He discovered that spot with his own telescope, and it was featured in the Daily Papers the next day. There's the headline of the Daily Mirror. And a few days later, Will Hay actually gave me a drawing he'd made of the white spot. And there it is, very prominently seen, just above the shadow crossing the disk cast by the ring. It was certainly due to an eruption from below the cloud layer, probably due to crystals of liquid ammonia condensing out. And it didn't last for long. Over the next few weeks, it spread out and became elongated and finally lost its identity in the generally bright equatorial zone. Another spot of the same kind, not quite so bright, appeared in 1960. And we've now had one in 1989, discovered in America. And that was a drawing I made of it a few days later. You can see there the white spot above the center of the disk over to the right-hand side. And it was pretty pronounced. Nothing like that had been seen since 1960. But um, to see it really well, you need large telescopes. And that was where the NTT, or New Technology Telescope, at La Silla in Chile, came into its own. And here's an NTT picture of the white spot. And as you can see, it really is very prominent. And it was important to astronomers too. It was telling us more about how Saturn behaves. But then, what about the Hubble Space Telescope? We've heard a great deal about Hubble's faulty mirror. But in some ways, you know, Hubble can still outperform any Earth-based telescope. And with Saturn, it certainly came into its own. Now, that Hubble picture was taken before the white spot appeared. But when the white spot was discovered, Hubble was turned towards it and produced magnificent pictures. We have here a time-lapse video. To start with, there's the spot, Gulf Gary of the Limb. And in a moment, it'll come back. There it is, going across over to the right-hand side now. Of course, this is speeded up. Saturn takes over 10 hours to spin round. There's the spot again, as you can see. And we're doing this in a few seconds. But certainly, there is no telescope other than Hubble that could show that nearly so well. Again, as with the earlier spots, same kind of thing. It didn't last. It gradually spread out, became elongated, and then was lost in the generally bright equatorial area. I looked at Saturn with my 15-inch telescope only a few nights ago, and that was how I saw it, and the spot is no longer identifiable, which is a pity, but it may be a long time before we see another one like it. But it's just as well we did have the NTT, and above all, the Hubble telescope, to record it while it was there. Now the rings. Now they're not solid or liquid. You couldn't have a solid or liquid ring. It would simply be torn to pieces by Saturn's gravity. For a long time now, we've known that Saturn's rings are made up of particles of ice, ranging from small blocks up to large chunks, and each going around Saturn in the manner of a dwarf moon. 
Before the space probe era, we knew there were two main rings, A and B, those are the bright ones, separated by a dark gap known as the Cassini division in honor of its discoverer. And then closer into the planet, there's an obscure ring, the C or crepe or dusky ring, which is less easy to see. And in the outer A ring, there's a minor division named after its discoverer, Johann Enker. Well now, thanks to the space probes, we know that there are further rings. There's the very extended E ring, the G ring, the twined F ring, and the so-called D ring, which is closest to the planet and isn't really a ring at all, but merely a zone where there are icy particles and you can't see that from the Earth. But although the other giants also have rings, Saturns are in a class of their own, and you can see them with a small telescope. And to demonstrate that, I went out a few nights ago and made a drawing of Saturn with my little three-inch refractor. And although it's not a very good drawing, I'm afraid, you can see there the yellowish, flattened disk, the belts, the rings, you can even see the Cassini division, and it's worth looking at. But most of our knowledge really comes from the space probes. Pioneer Leppin first, and then the Voyagers, which went by Saturn in 1980 and 1981, and sent back superb pictures. Just look at this, a truly exquisite view, with the shadow of the ring on the globe, and the globe on the ring, and the rings very much more complex than we thought. And then, on the disk, there are the clouds. This, of course, is a false colour picture, but it's quite clear that Saturn is a world in constant turmoil, and the winds there are, in fact, faster than those on Jupiter, the fastest winds in the entire solar system. But it is the rings which are really dominant. We didn't know there were thousands of minor ringlets and narrow divisions, but in fact there are, and they were beautifully shown by the Voyager pictures. And then, quite apart from that, there were strange features in the rings that we still don't really understand. There were the so-called spokes. And you can see them there, crossing the bright ring, radial things. And they shouldn't really be there. Because, as I've said, the rings are made up of particles, and the nearer a particle is to Saturn, the faster it goes. So you shouldn't have radial features, but you do. And we've even got time-lapse pictures of those. They come out from the shadow, and they last for some time as they move around the planet. Then they disappear, and they're replaced by new ones and you can actually see them from Earth. And when I was over at the La Cire Observatory last year, I made a drawing of Saturn with their 16-inch refractor, and I could see the spokes quite clearly, even though they're by no means obtrusive. But the rings, quite clearly, are not what we expected, and probably those spokes are due to particles elevated away from the ring plane by electrostatic or magnetic forces. And we do know that Saturn has a strong magnetic field, stronger than the Earth's. And unlike most of the other planets, the magnetic axis and the axis of rotation are almost exactly in the same place. So Saturn is a fascinating world. But it's not alone. It has a whole retinue of moons or satellites. And Saturn's family is unlike any other in the solar system. There's only one really large moon. There are plenty of smaller ones. The largest one is Titan. And there we see Titan compared in size with Mercury and the Moon. And it's over 3,000 miles across, so it really is big, and it does have an atmosphere. Then we have a whole colony of medium-sized moons between uh, 950 and 250 miles across. Rhea, Aepetus, Dione, Tethys, Enceladus, Mimas, Hyperion, and down there to the lower right, we've put in the British Isles to give you a scale. And there are many small moons, too, some of them discovered by Voyager. There again, over to the right-hand side, we have a larger view of Britain, and then we have Saturn's smaller satellites. All inner ones, except for Phoebe, uh, upper left, which is the outermost satellite, and goes round Saturn the wrong way, and is probably a captured asteroid. But all those, quite clearly, are pretty small. But the satellites of Saturn are by no means like each other, and they've all got their own particular characteristics. One very interesting one is Aepetus moving around Saturn at more than a million miles and taking 79 days to go around. And there is a Voyager picture of it. And as you can see, part of it's bright and part of it's dark. Actually, the sunlight is coming from the lower left, so that dark part of Aepetus really is dark. Well, like most of the satellites, it has a captured rotation. That's to say, it goes around Saturn in the same time that it takes to spin, 79 days. And when Aepetus is west of Saturn, its bright side is turned towards us, and it's fairly prominent. You can see it with a small telescope. And this is going to be the situation in July. There's Iapetus on the first, on the elongation, and all through July it's going to be west of Saturn, and a good three-inch telescope should show it. 
In August, it'll be on the east of Saturn and very much fainter. Now, just what is that dark stain? Because we know the density of Iapetus, which is not very much more than that of water, we are quite sure it is an icy globe with a dark stain, but just what the dark stain is, we don't know. It's probably due to material that's welled up from inside the satellite, but there's nothing else quite like it. Then we come to the satellites going inward towards Saturn. Hyperion, shaped rather like a hamburger, and this time it's tumbling round in space. Then we have icy, cratered, battered, rare. Another icy, cratered satellite, Dione, only about 700 miles across. Then we come into Tethys, almost pure ice. Then a curious one, Enceladus, part smooth and part the small craters. Then there is Mimus, with one huge crater there, dominating the entire scene. And closer in still, little Janus, which looks like, and probably is, part of a larger object which met with some disaster in the past and was broken up. The other part we can still see, and we call it Epimetheus. But of all Saturn satellites, very much the largest is Titan and it does have an appreciable atmosphere. And when Voyager 1 went past it, we had no idea quite what to expect. We didn't know whether or not we'd see the actual surface. In fact, we didn't. All we saw was the top part of a layer of cloud. But Titan, remember, is big, and therefore it's visible with a small telescope. And you might like to look for it uh, during July. This is a telescopic view south of the top, and there is Titan, like Apetus, west of the planet at the start of the month, and it goes round Saturn in 16 days, and you'll be able to follow it from night to night, looking like a star of about the eighth magnitude. But it is unlike any other satellite, inasmuch as it does have an atmosphere, and the Voyager sent back pictures of that, and you can see haze there above Titan's limb. And there's rather a lovely picture showing Titan as a crescent. But what's it really like? We've found out that the atmosphere is made up chiefly of nitrogen, which of course makes up 78% of the air that you and I are breathing. Most of the rest is methane. And therefore, all the ingredients for life on Titan exist, even though the temperature is so low that I'm quite sure life hasn't got going there. But all the same, it's a fascinating place, and um, in the year 2002, we should know a great deal more about it. In 1995, the Cassini probe is due to be launched. That will reach Titan in 2002 and drop a probe, the Huygens probe, onto the surface. And we are not sure whether that probe's going to come down on a solid ground or whether it's going to splash down in a chemical ocean. And it may well be that this is going to be the scene in 2002 when Huygens gets there. Saturn shining to the red clouds in the sky, a concealed sun, and possibly a probe splashing down into a chemical ocean. I can hardly wait to find out, and I can assure you, if I'm still doing the sky at night in the year 2002, we will give it absolute priority. Meanwhile, don't forget, look at Saturn if you can. It's going to be visible all through the summer. A small telescope will show the rings, and there's nothing else like it in the sky. I think it is the most beautiful sight of all. It really is the supreme example of a ringed planet. Well, it's newsletter time. If you want the newsletter, as usual, send your centuries envelope to Newsletter 42, Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W1207RJ, or tune in to CFAX page 616, or, of course, ring up the Sky at Night information line 0836 406075. Meanwhile, I'm going now to Mexico, because from there, on the 11th of July, there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun. And I only hope it's going to be as clear as it was during the last eclipse I saw, which I saw from the Philippines some time ago. And in due course, we'll bring you the pictures from there, though sadly, I'm afraid you won't see any part of the eclipse from here in Britain. So, for the moment, goodbye, and next month, I do hope you'll get to join me on a trip to Russia's rocket ground at Kazakhstan in the Soviet Union and watch a Russian rocket launch. For the moment, good night.